Part 29. Our History in the First Adam. In this opening chapter of Book 3, we will trace our history in relation to the first Adam, the ruin we received from Adam by inheritance, and the remedy we received from God by the cross. We cannot become what we already are in Christ until we know what we were in Adam. Therefore, it is important that we personalise the facts. This is my history. Everything in Adam is the ground of sin and death. Everything in the Lord Jesus is the ground of growth and life. Our responsibility is to keep off the old ground and to live on the new ground. And that is our position in Christ. So first we look at the old Adam, or the first Adam. To know what we were in Adam, we must discover what Adam was, since he is the head of the human race into which we were born. Thus we can understand the nature and condition of the life that we inherited from him, the life that continues to indwell us as believers. Adam sinned and entered death separated from God, who was the source of life. Through him we were born into sin and death and judgment and condemnation. We read in Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men. And death could not only come into the world and into the race, but it reigned as king. Again, in Romans 5, verse 17 and 18, we read the following. By one man's offence, death reigned by one. Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Let us note three basic aspects of our relationship then to that representative man, Adam. First, our position of sin, the Adam source. Second, our nature of sin, the Adam nature. Third, our personal sins, the Adam practice. To know the facts concerning the position and condition of our old life in Adam is to possess a vital key of spiritual growth. Ignorance or neglect here means certain defeat through one's Christian life. We look at our position of sin. Because of our fallen progenitor, Adam, each of us was born into a doomed humanity. As David wrote in Psalm 51 verse 5, In sin did my mother conceive me. In Adam we were declared to be dead in trespasses and sins because in Adam all die. Ephesians 2 verse 1 and 1 Corinthians 15 22. The result of our position in Adam, that is our source, the result of our position in Adam is that we are dead to God and alive to sin. Next, we look at our nature of sin. Our position of sin resulted in a sinful being, a sinful life, and therefore the propensity of that life is sinful. In Adam, we are by nature the children of wrath, Ephesians 2 verse 3. In this condition, we are natural, fleshly, carnal, separated from God. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says this, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. This fallen nature never changes, much less improves. John 3 verse 6 says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. The Adamic nature is self-centred, which is the sin of sins. Therefore it is totally against God and that irreparably against God. 
For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can it be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. I am carnal in Adam, sold under sin. Romans chapter 8 verses 5, 7 and 8 and chapter 7 verse 14. Next we look at our personal sins. The natural product of a sinful nature is sins. The practical result of our congenital condition is stated in scripture in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We grew up to be sinners in practice and that by choice. Hence, we were desperately in need of a saviour. If by careful study of the above, we allow the Holy Spirit to impress us with the awful truth concerning our history in Adam, we will be better able to appreciate the wonderful remedy that our Father has provided for us. So having looked at the first Adam and our position of sin in him, our nature of sin and our personal sins, we now look at the condemned Adam and we must continue to think in terms of our personal history. Now we want to see exactly what our father did to rectify this terrible relationship and condition. And so again we look at our position of sin in the condemned Adam. God did not forgive the principle of Satan-injected sin that dealt the death blow to the human race through Adam. He doesn't forgive sin any more than he forgives Satan. On the cross, in the person of his son, our father once and forever dealt with the principle of sin, thereby cancelling our position of sin. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 we read, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. While in Romans 8 verse 3 we read this. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin condemned sin in his flesh. Far from being forgiven, sin was judged. And sin was condemned in death. And so we look at our nature of sin. Our sinful life and sinful nature were not forgiven, but likewise were taken into the judgment death of the cross. All that we inherited from Adam suffered this same fate, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. Romans 6 verse 6. Had it been possible for God to forgive our old nature, it could then have been restored or reinstated. And so we look at our personal sins. Our sins were forgiven. Past sins, present sins and future sins. Forgiven by his blood shed on Calvary. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. 1 Peter 2.24 having made peace through the blood of his cross, Colossians 1.20, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, Revelation 1 verse 5. Now we look at Adam's relationship terminated. At last we can see ourselves at the very end of our history in Adam. On the one hand, we look at the cross. On the other hand, we look into the tomb. We might ask a few questions as to God's wonderful work in severing us from Adam. Why? Well, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. Representative Adam sinned. Therefore, everything Adamic was condemned to death. 
But then where and when? All of God's dealings with sin were accomplished in and by his son on the cross of Calvary. The last question is how? On the cross, the Lord Jesus was identified with our sin and our sinful nature, our old man thus being condemned and crucified with him. At the same time, in his substitutionary work of redemption, he paid the penalty of our sins. Thus, his death on our behalf completely freed us as individual believers from Adam and all Adamic penalties and consequences. This enabled God to justly include us in Christ's death to sin. Romans 6 verses 5 and 10 say this, We have been planted together in the likeness of his death, for in that he died, he died unto sin once. Having by his death borne the condemnation of sin and paid all its penalties, our Lord Jesus died unto, that is, out of the realm and the responsibilities of sin. Stripped of our relationship to Adam by and in that death, we have died in Christ unto the old, and we can now see ourselves in his tomb ready to be identified with him in his resurrection life and divine nature. Oh, let us prayfully think through these truths concerning our history in Adam, going over them until the Holy Spirit himself makes the picture really clear. The first step to my becoming free of the old man in the daily experience is to know that I was separated once for all from that life, that old Adamic life, by crucifixion and burial, the ultimate in deliverance, which is death. 30. Our history in the last Adam. Our history in the last Adam our risen Lord Jesus, begins on the only basis for resurrection life, which is death. Our relationship to the first Adam rendered us dead in sin, but our death with Christ made us dead to sin, or dead in relation to sin, the one condition for newness of life. So first, in Christ buried, there in the tomb we must see ourselves as dead to Adam, yet not yet alive to Christ. Our individual identity hasn't changed, but our relationship to the fleshly Adam has, and thank God. Therefore we have been buried with him. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ on the cross, having been buried with him. Romans 6 verse 4 and Colossians 2 verses 11 and 12. Death, that is our ruin, death has been made the very means of our triumph over it. Death is swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 54 and 57. Next, we look at in Christ risen. His death and burial having done its liberating work on our behalf, we can now begin to look up. That is, from death to Adam, fallen, to birth in Christ, risen. When the Lord Jesus burst the bonds of death, he took us with him in his glorious resurrection life. Just as Christ was raised from among the dead by the Father's glorious power, we also should live an entirely new life. For since we have become one with him by sharing in his death, we shall also be one with him by sharing in his resurrection. 
Romans 6, verses 4 and 5. Now, safely and forever on resurrection ground with him, we can study first our new position of life, second, our new nature of righteousness, and third, our new walk of fruitfulness. First, our new position of life. Whereas our old position in the first Adam made us dead to God and alive to sin, our new position in the risen last Adam makes us alive to God and dead to sin. In Colossians 3 verse 3 we read, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Formerly our judge, now by means of his son's death and resurrection, he is free to be our father and we his sons. We read in 1 John 3 verse 2, Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And in Galatians 4 verse 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Secondly, we look at our new nature of righteousness. In our co-resurrection with Christ, our Father gave us a new life with a new nature which can only bring forth righteousness. In 1 Peter 1 verse 3 we read this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The old life isn't changed, but exchanged for that which is altogether new. Paul's clearest description of this is given in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Our Father sees each of us as completely new in his Son. We have been forever freed from our relationship to the first Adam with its reign of sin and death. And he wants us to see ourselves from his point of view. That is, new creations in Christ Jesus. It might be helpful for us to consider further the fact that in this death to life transition, our personal identity is kept intact. We remain the same individual while acquiring a new position, a new life, a new nature in the risen Lord Jesus. The Father maintains the identity of each believer throughout the process of the cross, the tomb, and the resurrection. In Colossians 1 verses 21 and 22, and chapter 2 verse 13, we read the following. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet hath now he reconciled in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. We are in Christ ascended. Being identified with the Lord Jesus in his death to sin and his resurrection into life, we are also in him in his ascended life at the Father's right hand. Born from above, we are to abide above. In Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 to 7 we read the following. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, 
and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. Oh, and so thirdly, we look at our new walk of fruitfulness. As newly created believers, we are in the Lord Jesus in the heavenlies, while at the same time we are in the Spirit of Christ here on earth. The Comforter is our environment in this sin-cursed world. Romans 8 verse 9 says this, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. He it is who ministers the life of the Lord Jesus in us as our new life. It is he who develops the characteristics of that life in and through our new nature. On the one hand, he applies the finished work of the cross to the life of the flesh within. Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfil the lusts of the flesh, Galatians 5.16. On the other hand, he causes the fruit of the Spirit to grow in our new life. And remember that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Galatians 5.22 and 23. A close look at Galatians 2 verse 20 may further clarify the distinction between what we were in the first Adam and who we now are in the last Adam. Galatians 2 verse 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. There are vital differences here that, that when seen make a world of difference. First, I, that is the old man in Adam, I have been crucified with Christ. Secondly, it is no longer the old I that lives, but Christ lives in me, the new creation. Third, the life which I, the new man, now live in the flesh, in the body, I, the new man, live in faith. And fourth, this faith is in the Son of God who loved me as a lost individual and gave himself up for me, a sinner. The oft quoted words, not I, but Christ, tend to give the believer the impression that he, as a person, is crucified, and he is out of the picture, and that now there is only Christ as this new life. He's wont to feel that he must somehow get himself out of the way, and that Christ may be all. Granted, the old self must go down, but the new self must grow up. Oh, it's true that he is our risen life, but it is also true that he is the life and nature of our newly created life. Philippians 1.21 says this, For to me to live is Christ. And in Colossians 3.4, Christ, who is our life. We are not to become lost in him, but he is to be found in us. 2 Corinthians 4.11 says it this way, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. He lives in me, not instead of me, in me. He is the source and he is the motivation of my Christian life. I am to realise and rest in the fact that it is my being, my personality, which is enlifted.
affected by the human divine life and the nature of the Lord Jesus. I'm the same person, but with a new life in union with his life. By the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit, I will grow in grace and increasingly be conformed to his image. 31. Diametric Differentiation Let us distinguish yet further between the old life and the new. One important distinction is that sooner or later the healthy believer realises that he is not alone in his body. The condemned Adam nature from which he was delivered at the cross is nonetheless in residence and as sinful as ever. Unless we see the extent to which the cross separates us from the old, we will not be able to keep clear of the enslaving flesh and walk freely in the spirit. Our Father positionally separated us from the Adam life by our crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection and ascension life in the Lord Jesus Christ. One might ask why our Father, after condemning the old man in the death of his son, should allow that crucified life and nature to reside in his recreated and risen ones. God has perfect reasons for everything that he does. And we can list a few here for consideration. First, he does it to reveal the depth of sinfulness from which we were saved. Secondly, he does it to teach us to count ourselves dead to the old and alive to the new. Third, to teach us to abide in the Lord Jesus to abide above. Fourth, to teach us to walk in the spirit below. Fifth, to glorify the Father and manifest the life of the Lord Jesus despite a fallen nature and a fallen body and a fallen world. Sixth, to give us a good cause to watch for his appearing. Seventh, to give us a greater appreciation of eternal glory. In that there are two distinct natures seeking expression by means of our yet unredeemed body, we must keep them separated in our thinking. In itself, the old nature is ever strong to do evil. Only by the spirit is the new nature strong to bring forth righteousness. And so we look at the spirit and the old nature before we look at the spirit and the new nature. So first, the spirit and the old nature. The sinful nature dooms the sinner and defeats the believer. The growing Christian is sadly aware of the many ramifications of the flesh that fester within. In Galatians 5, verses 19 to 21, we read the following. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like. The progressing believer not only discovers the characteristics of the fallen nature, but he comes to know and experience his overpowering strength despite the fact that he is a new creation in Christ. The fallen life within is undergirded by the power of sin, the power of the body and, and the world. Romans 7.23 says this, I see another Lord in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. In time, the defeated believer realises that the Holy Spirit is the one who is commissioned to deal with the old man. We read in Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17, the following. 
This I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth or the flesh striveth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye may not do the things that you would. Although he could do so, the Holy Spirit doesn't deal with the fleshly life by means of his own strength. He doesn't have to. He depends on what God has already done about the old man. And so should we. The key to deliverance from the works of the flesh is not the strength, as we ultimately learn. Freedom comes by means of explicit faith. As we reckon on Calvary's crucifixion of the Adam life, the Holy Spirit applies the finished work to that life, thereby holding it in the position of death, inoperative. Next we look at the Spirit and the new nature. While the Spirit draws on the death of the cross to render the old nature powerless, he ministers the life of Christ to render the new nature productive. He works according to the principle of life out of death. And in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 11 we read, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Only the believer who has repeatedly gone down in defeat under the relentless power of the Adam nature can appreciate the necessity of walking in dependence on the Holy Spirit. It is the faithful Spirit who gives growth to our new creation life, slowly manifesting the very image of its source. This growth is evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit, as is set out in cluster form in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. We might give some thought to the first segment of that fruit of the vine, which is love. Obviously, this love is that of the Lord Jesus, resident in his nature, and therefore in our new nature. We are to behold this love as well as all the other characteristics of his life, in order that we may intelligently depend on the Spirit for their development in us. We can look at his love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 to 13. Love suffers long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love seeketh not her own and is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. Love rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Love beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never faileth, and now abideth faith, hope and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Follow after love. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. Before considering briefly how to follow after love, we must understand how we are not to walk. What are some of the characteristics of the old nature that we're to shun? Well, it it doesn't suffer long. It is unkind. It envies, vaunts itself, and is usually puffed up. It behaves itself unseemly. It seeks its own and is easily provoked and thinks evil. This Adam life within rejoices in iniquity and doesn't rejoice in the truth. It refuses to bear all things, to believe all things, it refuses to hope for all things and to endure all things. Quite the contrary, it always fails. Why be occupied with all that foul brood? So how are we to follow after love? 
We are to see where God has positioned us and live there. By means of crucifixion and resurrection, our Father has released us from the old life that cannot love and brought us into union with the life of the lover. Your life is hid with Christ in God. God is love. Corinthians 3.3 3 and 1 John 4 verse 8. As new creations in Christ, we no longer have to yield to the indwelling sin. The cross has freed us from its power. But we're responsible to abide in him by faith, in order that his love and righteousness may be manifest to this needy world. Much of the how to escape the old and become established in the new is embodied in Romans chapter 6, verses 11 to 13. First, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Secondly, therefore let not sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey its lusts. And third, do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. I make choices daily as to what ground I am on, either to be dominated and defeated by indwelling sin, or to be freed and growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. There can be no neutrality. The Lord Jesus has made it very clear no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Matthew six twenty four. And he that is not with me is against me. Matthew 12, verse 30. 32. In law. The believer will remain in bondage as long as he does not know that through the cross he's been delivered from the reign of the old man, the law, the world and the enemy. We've already discussed the Adam life and in this chapter we will deal with the law both as commandment and as principle. So first we look at the purpose of the law. Strictly speaking, God's formal law was given to the nation of Israel and to none other. The following points will clarify its place and its purpose. First, 430 years before God introduced the law, God gave Abraham the covenant of promise. This covenant had to do with faith and with Christ. Faith. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 and 9. And Christ. We read, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and two seeds, as of many but as of one, and to the seed which is Christ. Galatians 3.16 The Father's Old Testament expression of his one and only way of salvation was by grace, through faith in the coming Messiah. Secondly, four centuries after Abraham received the covenant of promise, God presented the law to the Jews. We read in 1 John 17 that the law was given by Moses. The law was not meant to replace the principle of promise, of grace and faith, but was brought alongside. We read, the law which was 430 years after cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Galatians 3, 17 and 18. 
Third, God's law is holy and the commandments are holy. They are just and good. Romans 7 verse 12. But it has to do with sin and death, not righteousness and life. We read in Romans 3.20, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law reveals man's condition and intensifies his need. In Romans 7.13 we read the following, But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Fourth, the law can have nothing to do with grace or faith or life. No man is justified by the Lord in the sight of God. The just shall live by faith. And the Lord is not of faith. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, until Christ, that we might be justified by faith. Galatians chapter 3, verses 11, 12, 23 and 24. So now we look at the law and the old nature. The law has to do with sin and therefore it applies to the Adam life, to the old man. First, the ministry of the Lord is to judge and condemn all that came from Adam. The law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for the sinner. For when we were in the flesh, in Adam, the sinful impulses, which were aroused by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. 1 Timothy 1 verse 9 and Romans 7 verse 5. Secondly, the fleshly Adamic nature will have nothing to do with God, nor can God have anything to do with it. He uses his law to judge and to condemn it to death. Romans 8 verses 6 and 7 says the following. For the mind set on the flesh is death because the mind set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. Next, we look at the Christian and the old nature. The old man, whether Jew or Gentile, is under the law. For the former, it is external via command. For the latter, it is internal via principle. We read in Romans 2, 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the external law, do by nature the things contained within the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. The old nature is law orientated. It's carnal, not spiritual. The Christian who is mainly living by means of the old life and thereby giving expression to the old nature is carnal, is fleshly. And note that the Latin word for carnal is carnis or flesh. Hence, whether by command or by principle, the law is predominant in his life. He is under law as a rule of life. He is in the Romans chapter 7. So we're going to look first at the result of law negative and then the result of law positive. The result of law negative. First, the law says, don't sin, so the old man struggles to keep from sinning. The law says, do righteousness. So it struggles to be righteous. But the law does not give the Christian power over sin. It gives power over the Christian. The strength of sin is the law. 
1 Corinthians 15, 56. I find then a law or an indwelling principle, writes Paul, in Romans 7, verses 21 and 19. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Secondly, the Christian who is walking after the flesh is walking under law and therefore is doomed to failure. Law applies to the fleshly life, but there is no good thing in the nature. It is neither subject to the law nor can it be. Romans 8 verse 18 and chapter 8 verse 7. The carnal believer is depending on fleshly means for deliverance from fleshly failure. He is looking for strength to the very source from which he is seeking deliverance. And thirdly, the Christian life becomes a burden and a continuous up and down experience. There's little hunger for the word of God. Prayer all but fades away. Sins are not honestly confessed. Hence, there's scarcely any true fellowship with the Lord. And instead of having a testimony and being a pattern, such a defeated believer becomes a detriment to others. What love he has is self-centred. There is none for the needy. Instead of manifesting the love of the new man in Christ, there is the opposite expression from the old man in Adam. Unkindness, envy, unseeming behaviour and other works of the flesh. Fourth, well, as to service, where there is any at all, it is mainly by means of self-effort, whether it's preaching or, or teaching or personal witness. Fleshly gimmicks and neat little methods are employed, but the flesh can only spawn more of its own kind. The problem, therefore, is compounded. From time to time there may be a bit of reviving in the life by means of dedication, but this usually results in deeper frustration and depression. There is no growth or fruitfulness for the believer in the legal realm. To such, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3, you are carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as the natural man? But finally, we come to the results of law that are positive. Through all this legalistic and fleshly failure, the Father is working out his eternal purposes. He is using the principle of law to bring the believer to the end of Romans chapter 7 which is, oh, wretched man that I am. Thus, the Christian is prepared for that wonderful exchange of faith, that of turning from the old, law-bound nature to his new life, a life of grace in the Lord Jesus. By the Spirit, he will be brought from the realm of the old, the Lord of sin and death, into the new the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8 verse 2. John Newton writes this, he says, By various maxims, forms and rules that pass for wisdom in the schools, I sought my passions to restrain, but all my efforts proved in vain. But since my saviour I have known, my rules are all reduced to one. To keep my Lord by faith in view, this strength supplies and motive too.